This is the story of a ragtag bunch of church members who set out to perform a Christmas play, and the director who tried his hardest to just keep it all together. The glory of Christmas. Our annual Christmas show is tonight, and all the hard work, the blood, sweat, and tears comes down to this very moment. And like, like any show, there's going to be some last-minute snafus. Um, like, like, for example, my middle-aged Mary, she's been having contractions for about six, 16 hours. My Joseph hasn't memorized all his lines. Uh, Amy? Mary, my, <laughs> my dear Mary, it's been a long journey. My wise man is convinced that the nativity set will collapse. And my shepherd can't find a lemon for his tea. Articulatory agility as a marvelous ability, manipulating with dexterity that... We are telling the most beautiful and important story that's ever been told about an event that changed the... We've lost the lamb. Mm -hmm. Quick, everyone make lamb noises. Call her back to the flock. He knows the lamb's a dog, right? Medical experts actually do not recommend this method for uh, dealing with panic attacks. But my mom recommends lavender behind the ears. Get away from me. I'm calling an ambulance. I think I'll be fine. It's for me. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Thank you guys so much for coming. All right, this is everyone. It's time. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, and unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. I have this long-held tradition, I guess you could call it. Every year during the performance, I, uh, I step off the stage and leave the building. I just want God to do what God does. And the shepherds came with haste, and they found, found Mary, Mary and Joseph, Joseph and the baby, the baby lying in the manger. It doesn't matter where you see the nativity story, whether it's on a street corner or, or in a church or even on your neighbor's mantle. When you see it, you, you have to consider it then and there. Are you willing to kneel at the manger? Will you believe in the miracle of Christmas, the glory of Christmas? Trust that this is the way that God chose to save us all. And all who heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned. Glorifying and worshiping God for all the things that they have seen and heard as it was said unto them. Amen. However, what we learn throughout the month of December doesn't have to stay in the month of December. Now, today is our... There, I'm unmuted. It's my fault. Uh, today is our final week of this Glory of Christmas series, and I just want to take a minute for us to kind of go back and review what we learned so that we can carry some of this with us. 
So the last four weeks, we've kind of focused on character profiles. And so we looked at Mary, a, a young, engaged uh, Jewish uh, woman who had her life planned out. And like many of us in 2020, her plans got interrupted. And when the angel came to her, she first was disturbed, but later she was found rejoicing. And we looked at what made the difference. How did she go from trouble to rejoicing? And what we saw is that God revealed his presence. God revealed his power and God revealed his promise. And we, found, we discovered that the glory of Christmas comes when God's presence, God's power and God's promise is, re is revealed when it's responded to in faith and when we remember it and carry it throughout our days. The next week, then, we looked at Mary's uh, counterpart, or if you will, uh, Joseph. And Joseph was given the tall order, to say the least, to be the adoptive earthly father to the Son of God. And what we kind of thought about was that how often the God's call on our life, we feel or are unqualified for. And, and the reason that's the case is so that God can kind of show off, that, that he can receive the glory. And we kind of examine Joseph as a person that put himself in position to be used by God. So, for example, he was someone that always, through, through every kind of step in the way, he was trying to do what was right based on the information that he had. We saw that he was someone that had compassion despite what you know, he might have thought when he first heard the news of that Mary was pregnant. He had compassion on her. And then finally, throughout the way, he's selflessly obedient to what is expected of him. In fact, he, you, you see him and he's not interested in, he's not focused on himself. He, he's focused on Mary He's focused on others, and ultimately, he's focused on the Lord. And, and we saw that when, when we do the same, when we realize and we live for the Lord's will in our life, that the glory of Christmas is when we realize that we aren't the star, that it's not all about us. We're not the center uh, of the universe, kind of like we talked about uh, last week as well. The third week, we talked about the shepherds, the shepherds who were out in the fields nearby, the shepherds who, uh, when you do look at their power and privilege, they had none. They were in the peasant class of that time. And yet, these humble shepherds were exalted to a position of being the first outsiders to hear the announcement that the king of kings was born and the first outsiders to see him there in the manger. We saw that the Caesar Augustus, had, who was very powerful and, and, and had a royal decree that everybody had to follow, that even he was under the thumb of God because that God is sovereign and no matter who's ruler, God is on the throne. And we see Caesar Augustus humbled in that way that it's not all about him, but that really God was orchestrating this for his plan of salvation to bring Jesus into the world. And, and that same week, we looked at Jesus, born as a baby, humble. And, and mankind, and he lived his life in humility. In fact, he was even willing, as Brian reflected upon, to die on the cross for our sins. He was willing to go on the cross and, and shed his blood to atone for the ways that we have uh, disobeyed God in our lives. He, his body was then taken and placed in a tomb, and three days later they went to that tomb. He's no longer there, and he rose from the dead, and, and he spent 40 days on earth showing himself in his glorified state. So it would be no question that Jesus is alive, and then after that 40 days, he ascended to the Father at his right hand in, in glory. And so this humble of Jesus was exalted, and we saw that part of the glory of Christmas is that the exalted or those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And then just last week, we looked at the Magi, uh, the wise men, sometimes known as the three kings. And these wise men, or these Magi, were affluent foreign dignitaries sent on a diplomatic mission. And it seemed like wherever they went, as they went into Jerusalem, all eyes were on them. They were able to get uh, access to, the, to, to King Herod at the time, no problem. Yet when they came and they saw the baby Jesus where he was, we saw that they pipto proskuneo, they, they fell down and they, they fell on their knees. 
And, and they realized that though the, the, for a moment as we were studying the Magi, they were kind of center stage, they realized that they really aren't center stage. And kind of really maybe the whole reason for the season, we said that the glory of Christmas is Jesus. And so what I want us to do today is as the, the director, if you will, in the, in the video said, that whenever you see the nativity, you have to pause and you have to reflect upon it. Well, I want us, as we think about the nativity narrative and everything we've learned in this series, is I want us to be able to continue to take that into our everyday lives, that we would keep Jesus in the center of our lives. This past week, in fact, on Christmas Day, uh, my family went out to see Christmas lights for the second or third time. Anybody go out and see Christmas lights at some point uh, this week besides me? Okay, I'm not alone, all right? So we went around and we, we saw some, some Christmas lights. It was really enjoyable. We, we, we strategically planned it, though. Um, so like a lot of families with children in the household, we were up late for Christmas morning. And then the kids, though, didn't know that the parents were up late, did they? And they were waking up at 5 a.m. And so it was a tough day, Christmas day. It was fun, but it was tough. We were really, really tired. And so we strategically planned, well, we'll have dinner and then we'll go look at Christmas lights, hoping that maybe one or two would fall asleep. And, and sure enough, they, they almost all fell asleep. I mean, Cole was even thinking about uh, falling asleep. And, and, and so um, I have four kids. And so uh, Johanna was asleep, my youngest, and then Josiah, and then Lydia fell asleep. But once in a while, she would wake up and say, I'm awake, or, or yeah, I like that, you know, and then she'd go back to sleep, you know. So she was kind of halfway there with us. But one of my favorite displays we saw was off of Nine Mile Creek Road uh, towards Fall Creek. And uh, if you guys know the Chubner family and the Anger family, they live out that way. But there's this um, lighted display, and it's one of those that you turn to your radio on and synchronize with music. And so right away, that's pretty neat, you know. And, and we had already seen another one of those that night before, earlier. But this one I was just so impressed with. I, I was just it was by far the best I've seen. It was just really, I mean, several times I'm like, wow, whoa, that's neat, you know? And um, so we, I don't know how long, I guess it goes on for a really long time. We listened to like three songs or so, and everybody was asleep, and Cole's like, can you shut the music off? I want to go to sleep. So we're like, yes, let's go home, you know? Uh, we're ready for this. So we, we, we pull off, and I noticed something as we as we were getting ready to leave. And it wasn't center stage, but yet it was still there. They had a nativity in fact, that night, one of the things that kind of became like a Where's Waldo thing, as we looked at Christmas lights, I began to start looking for the nativity, looking for Jesus. And honestly, I was pleasantly surprised how I kept finding the nativity and kept finding Jesus. It was nice to see him amongst the Santa Clauses or snowmen or whatever type of light display that someone might have had. In fact, in fact one home, we drove by, and it happened to be somebody that, that, that we know, and uh, we actually didn't know that they were Christians. We actually thought they weren't, and the only holiday light display they had was a nativity. But, but here's the truth. If we are going to keep Jesus in the center of our lives, it's going to take more than a nativity in the yard. It, it's going to take more than sitting in the sanctuary on Sunday. It's going to take more than a cross hung in the hallway. Uh, we need to do more than that, to be able to keep Jesus in the center of our lives. And so how do we do that? How do we do that so we can be grounded in the gospel and sustained by the Spirit? Well, if you have your Bible with you, uh, we are not going to look at a traditional Christmas passage this morning. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, it's the uh, New Testament, and feel free to look at table of contents if you need to, uh, but if you kind of go halfway in the New Testament, you might come across it, or Romans, and then after Romans is 1 Corinthians, after 1 Corinthians is 2 Corinthians. So Paul is writing this letter, uh, the Apostle. Uh, it's called 2 Corinthians because he's writing to a church located in a city known as Corinth. And one thing I want us to think about these Christians living in the city of Corinth is that there was a lot in their lives that would keep them from keeping Jesus in the center. And this was not just true for the city of Corinth, but kind of true for Paul's life as well, because he was going through a lot and a lot of persecution. And so it would have taken a lot of effort to keep Christ in the center. And so the city of Corinth was um, a city that had all kinds of cults. 
They had uh, all, all sorts of idols and false gods. There was even a, a prostitute shrine there. I mean, there was a lot of challenges there. Yet, the gospel took root. It took hold. The, the power of God was displayed. People's lives were transformed. Yet, if you read 1 Corinthians, you'll notice that the church had some problems. Uh, they had some division going on. There's some moral, questionable moral stuff going on. And so Paul writes that letter to kind of to correct the course a little bit. However, that correction wasn't exactly well received. And it, there was an in-person visit, and it didn't go so well. And, and there's, uh, there's some tension between uh, Paul and, and the church. But the church kind of said, you know, they, they felt bad eventually about how they treated him. And so Paul is, is trying to reestablish his relationship and, and, and kind of concrete it with this second letter. He's trying to say, hey, I'm an apostle. Uh, and, and some of the Corinth, Corinthians had been distracted by really eloquent speakers and more influential or rich people. And they were like, oh, we want to listen to them. But it was taking him away from the gospel. And so Paul says, yeah, I'm poor and I've been beaten and, and, and maybe I'm not as eloquent speaker speaker, but uh, I am an apostle. And so part of this uh, letter, he's trying to give his credentials, if you will, to say, I have a, a right to be apostle and to, to lead you. But also he's trying to say, hey, despite everything that's going on and, and despite how harsh some of this communication has been between us, I want you to know I still love you and I'm still genuinely concerned for you and, and I want to see you grow and, and flourish. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 4 then, leading up to this, he, in chapters 4, 5, 6, and 7, basically, in the letter, he's going to say, listen, it's all about the gospel, and it's all about what Christ, the cross, and, and, and we need to uh, have this message, and it's the message of salvation. It's the message that tells us our, our character. My, and Paul says, my character and your character and, and our way of life. And so that's the context of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and, and he, here's, here's the reality. He's going to write to them knowing that his life and their lives isn't always easy. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we'll just start in verse 7. He says, but we have this treasure. So treasure is the gospel, okay? We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Now, he's not saying that there's like jars of clay he's carrying around and he's got, you know, gospel, you know, written down and it's inside that uh, literal jars of clay. What he means by jars of clay is something basic, something unimpressive, that you could go in the city of Corinth and buy a jar of clay easily. It's not a jar made out of stone or a jar made out of gold or glass. I don't know if they had glass jars, but it, it, it's, it's, it's something simple and cheap, a jar of clay, unimpressive. And, and he said part of the reason that we keep it in, in, in these uh, that though I'm unimpressive and I keep this treasure, and I want to, it's because I want to show the power of God. That it's not about me and how great I am. I want to show how it's about God and how great He is. Verse eight, He says, "We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed; perplexed, but not in despair; persecuted, but not abandoned; struck down, but not destroyed." And so Paul says, listen, I've been through a lot, and Paul has gone through experiences that hopefully we will never go through. Uh, just for preaching the gospel and doing what God had called him to do. He's, he's beaten, he's flogged, he's put in prison. He was even stoned or attempted to be stoned for his faith in sharing the gospel. And yet, though we won't go through some of those experiences that, that Paul went through, we all, in times of our lives, experience that life is hard. And 2020 has, has been no exception. Perhaps we think that Paul actually described 2020, hard-pressed, perplexed, uh, persecuted, that we were struck down. However, despite these circumstances, despite everything he's going through, he says, I'm not crushed. I'm not in despair. I haven't been abandoned, nor have I been destroyed. And so the question I have is, how is it possible? How is it possible going through all those difficulty things that he wasn't destroyed, that he, that he, that he wasn't completely crushed, that he wasn't in despair? How is it that going through all that, can he keep Jesus in the center of our lives? And I believe if we can figure that out, if we can learn that, then we can take and make sure that Jesus is in our life beyond Christmas as well. So let's just skip down to verse 16 of 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore, we do not lose heart. So despite all this going on, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we, bring renew, we are being renewed 
day by day. For our light and momentary troubles, I'm not sure if I would call what Paul has been going through as light and momentary troubles, but it's all about perspective. Listen to his perspective. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes. And so here he's talking about perspective. If you change where your focus is, where your eyes are, your perspective will change. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Folks, if we are going to keep Jesus in the center of our lives, it's going to take more than that nativity scene in the yard, the cross hung on our hall, or a sitting in a seat in the sanctuary on Sunday. We have to shift our, shift our focus. We have to move from focusing on our troubles, which is seen, and focus on that which is unseen. And in so doing, the text says, um, we will be renewed day by day, though we are outwardly wasting away. Have you experienced that in your life, this idea that outwardly we're wasting away? The Christian comedian Mark Lowry says, we're fighting the battles of the bees. Baldness, bifocals, bridges, bulges, bow-legged knees, and bunions. And some of the uh, younger people in our audience don't know what half those things are. But uh, your time is coming. Your time is coming. Everybody ages, except for maybe Aaron Rodgers, who's 37 year old and having a great career in the NFL still. Uh, that being said, uh, how can we, though we're just outwardly wasting away, despite whatever trials, tribulations, and temptations that we may face, how can we not lose heart? How can we be renewed day by day? How can we keep Jesus at the center. And the first uh, answer to that question is a daily encounter with the Word of God. If you want your perspective to change really quickly, get in the Word. You know, it's kind of um, like a paradox that Paul says, I want you to see the unseen. It's like, how can we see something that's unseen? Well, the Scripture reveals that to us. The, the, the Bible is, is more than some really neat stories. The Bible is more than, than the nativity narrative. The Bible is more than just moral instruction. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed. The Bible is the Word of God. It's coming from Him. It says it is useful for teaching and rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. And then I like what Hebrews says about the power of the Word of God. It says this in uh, Hebrews 4.12. It says, the Word of God is living and active. It's not about the, the text on the page. It's living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. And so those texts on the page can, can interact with your spirit. And it's sharper than a double-edged And what does a double-edged sword does? It penetrates, and so can the Word of God. It, it penetrates, even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. You know, a sword, if you have a sword penetrate your body, that's not always, that doesn't sound pleasant, does it? And the truth is, if you're having a daily encounter with the Word of God, there's going to be days you're going to be encouraged. You're going to be lifted up. You're going to be reminded of the gospel. You're going to be, you're going to be walking on cloud nine. Yet there's also going to be days where it's going to be piercing. It's going to be piercing in your life. It's going to judge your thoughts and your attitudes. The earlier verse says it, it, the, the Word of God is for rebuking and correcting, because here's the reality. If Jesus is not where he needs to be in our lives, we need to correct course. We need to be rebuked. We need that, that penetration into our thoughts and our minds so we can be set right. I like what Romans says. It says this, that do not conform to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What will happen when you do that? Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You see, there's patterns in the world that want to shape the way you think. And, and it could be all sorts of things. It could be your peers and, the, and the, their worldviews and their influence. It could be the media trying to, to manipulate or make you think a certain way. 
It could be politics. It could be a temptation. Uh, there's so many things that is trying. Uh, it could be advertisements. There's so many things that will try to get our focus off of Jesus. So many things that will try to brainwash us into thinking the way that the world thinks. And we can easily lose our focus on Christ. And 2020 has had plenty of things to distract us, you know, pandemic and racial issues and the election. And there's been so much to distract us, keep us um, away from Christ. And guess what? I don't know what 2021 is going to, to, to hold for us. But here's what I know. Unless we are having daily time in the word of God, we are going to be easily distracted as well. We're going to be pushed and pulled in different directions by social media, and we're going to lose our focus on Christ. And so we need to have a daily encounter with the Word of God. Um, If you do not currently have a a daily encounter with the Word of God, uh, I want to encourage you to join me, especially in the new year. So it's kind of a long story, but the short of it is I decided that in 2021... Uh, I, at least, am going to read through the Bible in 2021. I've, I've read through the Bible before and uh, in a year before, and I've decided 2021 is going to be that year for me. And so um, there's an app called the YouVersion Bible app. And so if you have a smartphone, that's the easiest and best way to follow along. It will send you reminders. Uh, you can uh, check off what you're supposed to read for that day. And at the end, we can actually do it together to the point that it'll say, how has God spoken to you? And you can leave a little comment like, oh, I have heard the gospel, or, you know, whatever it is, or I just was lifted up, or I felt the penetration of the Word of God, and it was difficult, you know, whatever it might be, but it's a way to hold each other accountable and kind of hear how, hear how it's uh, relating to other people. Now, if you don't want to do that, um, on the back table today after church, there's some um, reading guides, reading plans, and it's my favorite reading plan. There's all kinds of ways you can read through the Bible, you know, uh, from front cover to back cover, or what have you. This one, uh, reads every word of the Bible, but does it a book at a time. So you'll read Genesis first, and then after you get through Genesis, you'll read Mark, and then there's a break once a week as well. So you can you know, catch up if you need to, or just reflect on the past week, hopefully, um, that sort of thing. So um, I want to encourage you to join you. If you're already having daily time with, with God and in, in, in Word, you don't need to replace that. There's many people I know that maybe you're reading through the Bible with someone else, or you're... Um, reading a daily proverb or following a devotion, something like that, keep it up, okay? Don't, sometimes if you, if you get out of that routine, it will get you out of that routine. Um, I'm just inviting you to join me in that routine in the new year. And when we do that, when we can stay in the word of God on a daily basis, I believe that will help us achieve that renewal day by day and keep Jesus at the center. The second thing that we need to do, again, this is a daily thing, is a daily time of prayer and confession. Now, when I use the word confession, some of you might be thinking like going to see a priest or something like that. I'm not talking about that. What the Bible teaches us is that we have the priesthood of all believers. Jesus is our mediator. Therefore, we have direct access to God. Okay, and so we can go directly uh, to him. We don't need uh, a priest to go through. We don't need a a, a saint or uh, any other mediator except for, for Christ. And so the primary way that God will speak to us is through his word. So that's where we have that daily encounter with the word of God. And the primary way that we can speak to God is through prayer. And do you remember what Jesus said to his disciples? I think it's really important for us to consider in light of what we've been reading. He tells his disciples, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Though we are wasting away outwardly, we can be renewed day by day. And one way to do that is to be alert, to keep watch, and to pray. Watch and pray. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Though we are wasting away inwardly, we can be renewed day by day. And so what prayer does is prayer says, you know what? I am a jar of clay. <laughs> I, I can't handle what's, what's going on in my life. I need to depend on on God. It's a time that we acknowledge our dependence of God, and it's a time that we can confess to God that life is more than I can handle. I remember when I was um, a minister in, in Louisiana, and I was uh, at a hospital in Shreveport, and I was visiting a 30-year-old man whose body was being ravaged with leukemia, and he, it was very visibly evident that he was wasting away. And I remember him telling me, he said, you know, Justin, 
I know that God can't give us, won't give us more than we can handle, but this is just too much. Now, I didn't exactly correct his theology right then and there. I just tried to minister him with his current understanding at that moment in this, this difficult situation. But to be honest, the Bible actually doesn't say that. Uh, I've heard many people say, well, the Bible, you know, God won't give us more than we can handle. I, my understanding of Scripture, and I think we'll see this together, is that, yeah, he will. <laughs> yeah, he will, and maybe even on purpose. He'll give us more than we can handle. If you're in uh, 2 Corinthians 4 still, why don't you turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Sometimes he'll give us more than we can handle so that we'll remember that we're jars of clay and we need to depend on him and turn to him in prayer and confession that, so that we'll depend on him. Listen to what Paul says. This is 2 Corinthians 1 verse 8. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we've experienced in the province of, provinces of Asia, uh, province of Asia. So we kind of talked about some of those problems. It says, we were under great pressure. And what does he say? Far beyond our ability to endure. He's saying, more than I can handle. Right? Wouldn't that be another way of saying that? More than I can handle. Far beyond our ability to endure. So that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt like we received the sentence of death. But this happened. So he got to the point that he was more than he could handle because... But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raised us from the dead. Verse 10, he has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that, we will continue, that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your what? What does it say? Prayers. As you help us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted to us granted us in answer to the prayers of many. Paul says, yeah, I've gone through more than I can handle, but my hope is in Christ, and my help comes from prayer. Now, I also added confession very intentionally on this particular point as well about keeping Christ at the center. Because one thing that will quickly push Christ aside, one thing that will quickly cause us to wear out, one thing that will quickly cause us to lose heart, one thing that will quickly rob us of joy, one thing that will quickly make us discouraged is unconfessed sin. And so we need to confess the sin directly to God. And you know what? The Bible says confess your sins to one another. And so you need to have a brother and sister in Christ that you can confess your specific sin to. Because it can be healing, and that, that person can, can encourage you and, and hold you accountable. That person can say, well, remember the grace of God and, and remember the path he's put you on to. And, and, and so it's important to have other people um, in your life, but you can confess it directly to God. And I love uh, what uh, Acts says about repentance. It says this, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out so that times of refreshing may come to the Lord. And, you know, sometimes we think confession and confessing our sins is, is difficult, and it probably is. It often is difficult, but often there's the times that we let it out and we, we, we confront it, that we can experience that inward renewal, that daily renewal day by day. It's a way that we can keep Jesus at the center. And the third way that we keep Jesus at the center is here on the screen by daily praising God in song. Now, I know not, not all of you are singers, and before COVID, I sat next to some of you, and I know that not all of you are singers, okay? Uh, and, and I'm not either. I'm in your same boat. You know, the only time I'm allowed to sing uh, is when I sing a hymn mashup of Softly and Tenderly on a Hill Far Away. That's the only time I'm allowed to sing uh, is, is when, when, when I, I do that. But here, here's, here's the truth. Um, you don't have to sing. You can just listen. You know, if you have a smartphone, open up YouTube, you can... Listen to any Christian song you can think of, whether it be a new one or a hymn or what have you, if you have you know, Apple Music or Spotify or whatever it is. And if you don't have a smartphone, there are still stores that sell CDs, okay? And you can get a CD and, and listen to that. Worship renews us. Worship helps us focus on the unseen. It gives us a new perspective. For some, and some of you told me this before, that God seems to speak to you more clearly and vividly and powerfully in song than anything else. 
Because here's the, here's the issue. Whenever we go through difficulty in life, day by day, in the minutia of life, all of a sudden, th- those difficulties can become bigger than they, th- than they are. It can be like the side view mirror. They're, they're bigger than, than they, 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 uh, they actually are. And so worship um, renews our eyes. Worship refocuses um, our eyes so that we can get them off the problems and get them on our Savior. Get them off the tough situations. No longer focus on these light and momentary troubles that are seen, but rather focus on the unseen. When we worship, our spiritual eyes are opened to the power, to the presence and the promise of God, just like it was for Mary. And we can see his might and his faithfulness even in a time of trial and temptation. You know, we talked about the things that Paul went through, and we mentioned imprisonment. When he was in the city of Philippi, for example, uh, he cast out an uh, evil spirit from a slave girl, and the slave girl had the ability to do, do fortune telling, and she made money for her owners by doing that. But when the spirit was cast out, she no longer had that ability, and guess what? Her owners weren't real happy that they could no longer make money off of her. And so they took Paul and Silas and they brought him to the marketplace and they said, they're causing up an uproar. And there was a crowd there and the crowd went along with them and they, and they were against Paul and Silas. And so the officials said, they need to be flogged and thrown in prison. And that's exactly what happened. They were flogged and then thrown in prison, all for doing the will of God. And there's an interesting scene. It's recorded in Acts. And we kind of get an insight of what it was like for them in prison, what they were doing. And this is exactly what they were doing. This is uh, Acts chapter 16, verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. I don't know about you, but I feel like if this was me and written about me, it's like about midnight, Justin was weeping and crying and wailing in the corner. <laughs> but what were they doing? They, they changed their focus. They were changing their perspective. They weren't looking at the four walls of the prison, but they were looking at the eternal God and giving him praise and glory. And here's what's cool about that. They were doing aloud, and so the other prisoners were listening in. I don't know exactly what effect that had on the other prisoners, but very easily it might have changed their perspective too. It might have changed their perspective as well. They kept their focus on Jesus even in the midst of prison. And so you know what? If if Paul and Silas can do this while they're, they're in prison. I think myself and us together, I think we can carve out some time in our daily lives to be with God and keep Jesus in the center. As I said, I don't know what the future holds for 2021, but I do know the one who holds the future. I don't know what you're going to face. And outwardly, we're wasting away. So for many of us, we will be less healthy well, we'll be weaker than we were in the year before. But this is what my prayer for you is 2021. My prayer for you is that 2021 will be the healthiest year you've ever had spiritually. I want spiritual health for you in 2021. I pray that you will experience daily renewal. I pray that you will keep Christ at the center of our lives. And we do that, one, by being here on Sunday morning. We do that by being here on Sunday morning. The reason we gather is to keep Christ in the center. We gather to do this in remembrance of me, to remember Christ. We want him never to, it's why we do communion every single week. We got to remember the cross. We got to remember the kingdom. Of, we, we're doing so until we eat again in the kingdom of God with him. We remember that the cross is empty and he rose from, from the grave. We remember that each week. But here's the reality is that not just, it needs to be something that we not do just on Sunday. Some of you know that part of my outwardly wasting away that I personally dealt with is something called diverticulitis. And uh, you don't want me to go into details, but it's not fun, okay? And um, whenever I've had it, they've always given me an antibiotic, and it's something you take three times a day for 10 days, okay? And I've been blessed that, I don't know if it's just, you know, the severe severity of my you know, infection or what have you, that usually after about 24 to 48 hours, I'm better. Like, I'm feeling good and, you know, I, I, I can function 100%. But my question for you is, what if I, as soon as I started feeling better, I was like, I don't need this mess anymore. What, was going, what would happen? Or, or what if I said, well, it says three times a week for 10 days, but I just think I'll take it once a week. It's not going to work, is it? You know, maybe I would have felt better for 24 hours, but it would quick, that infection would quickly come back. Folks, our body is weak. 
We are faced daily with the weakness of our flesh. And this might come in the form of a temptation. It might come in the form of suffering. And so we need a daily antidote. And so we need to consume daily spiritual medicine so we can remain vibrant and healthy, so we can experience renewal day by day. Therefore, take your eyes off what is seen. And let us, despite Christmas being behind us, let us move forward, keeping our eyes focused on Christ. And the way that we're going to do that is through daily time in the Word of God, daily time in prayer and confession, and daily worshiping God in song. Let's pray together.